20th of February. Hope you all had a, a good weekend. Uh, just taking a quick look at the, the broader kind of asset classes this morning, as you can see on my charts. Got a mix of the currencies and gold at the top, the DAX S&P in the middle, and crude and T-notes in the bottom uh, right-hand corner. So moderate risk on this morning. Uh, quite a few bits of news items we'll talk about shortly, but nothing really, I would say, substantial that's prompted this kind of move. More so, uh, a bit of a follow on the Asian session being positive following Wall Street's <coughs> climb to another record at the end of last week. Uh, trading conditions as well overnight in Asia, a little bit lighter uh, than normal and that will probably be the case throughout today's session, particularly in the second half as we get into the, the afternoon in London and then certainly later in the evening, given it's the President's Day holiday uh, in the US, which means that their markets are closed in terms of the pit trade and shorten electronic schedules. Uh, what that means then is lower volumes and liquidity. It can make the price action a little jumpy when liquidity drops off later. So something to just be mindful of, but it could be a, a front loaded day in terms of real kind of more defined market movements. Uh, certainly to keep that in mind uh, today with that US holiday. A uh, couple of things though, equity wise that I have seen this morning, obviously the DAX has seen a, a marginal gap up, uh, sitting briefly test uh, up at around well, it would have been Friday's R2, I guess, but that high print that we had towards the middle part of last week has uh, just pulled back slightly, but still elevated this morning. A couple of individual stock stories to be aware of. Uh, RBS shares in London, they're up around 5%. Uh, a good update from one of their trading arms, Williams & Glen. Uh, Rolls-Royce are up 4.5% on a positive broker move. BT Group uh, looking at a settlement with Ofcom, they're up 2%. Uh, one of the other, or two big names though, that have fallen substantially, you've probably seen their headlines about a, a phenomenally large size M&A deal, Kraft, have pulled out of their $143 billion Unilever offer after early opposition. Well, Unilever shares this morning down about 8%. So that's a pretty significant fall in their shares. And Bovis Homes, just quickly on the, the UK housing sector, did have some data out of right move overnight. And UK house price growth is now at its slowest in four years. Um, we've had Bovis Homes, one of the uh, home builders in the UK, they've had a profit warning this morning. And they're down about 9% as well. So um, not having a broader impact on the on the, the market as such, but quite interesting to see uh, these specific sectors, the housing, you know, if you're looking for any sort of bellwether for the UK housing market going forward, then the outlooks issued by the various home builders like Barrett Developments, Bovis Homes, Wimpy and so on uh, are quite telling and Bovis Homes had a profit warning this morning. A quick look though, just getting into the actual crux of the news flow from the weekend and uh, really you can't go long without talking about politics. They are still the, the kind of defining um, leader of market trends at the moment and I'm not going to go into the Trump Sweden blooper if you like. I think that's all you can make of that what you will. I think it's the least surprising thing I've probably read at the weekend that he'd make such a mistake like that. But Focusing more on Europe and looking at the French situation firstly, these are the type of headlines that have been quite common this morning. French election wide open after the weekend where everyone stumbled. So essentially they're all kind of jostling for position here with the, the voting public. Uh, and with nine weeks to go, you basically had uh, independent Emmanuel Macron ensnared by the country's colonial past and attempts to unite the left fizzle. Uh, earlier signals are considering a joint candidacy with the socialist Benoit Hamon and far-left campaigner Jean-Luc uh, Mélenchon ending up trading barbs rather than their differences. Um, Hamon backfiring saying uh, I won't run together with Mélenchon and I don't run after anyone. 
So that kind of fell apart. Any ideas that they potentially could team up and they'd be stronger together. You've also had Marine Le Pen, which is obviously she's grabbed most of the press attention. Herself and Francois Fillon, uh, both blown off course. Again, this is that they both kind of come under the same exact problem. Misused public funds. Fillon probably more public with that uh, a few weeks ago in regards to uh, his family, his wife and, and so on but now kind of Le Pen coming under the same problem. So certainly in the French elections, it's getting a bit, let's say, um, the campaigns are getting quite messy in terms of trying to unearth skeletons from the closet to make things more difficult. But all that this means, I guess, from a market perspective is that it's just likely to increase uh, uncertainty around the situation where everyone's having a a bit of an issue in trying to, to get a clear, distinct advantage at the moment. Elsewhere in Italy, Renzi has quit as party leader um, at the weekend, triggering a re-election battle against minority descendants that threatens the stability of the centre-left government. So still, Italy, if you remember back in, I think it was September, when we had a kind of a miniature bank run at the time, when recapitalization was a real big key theme, Monte de Paschi was kind of dominating the press. Um, we had the the constitutional referendum in Italy, but that's kind of taken a bit of a back seat. But things like this might bring it back to the fore again if there's re-election fights that go on. Again, the anti-establishment uh, or Eurosceptic type parties like the Five Star Movement, if we are to have any type of um, moving towards elections in Italy uh, it could be telling in that front as well and then looking at quickly at Germany where you've had Angela Merkel Germany's centre-left social democrats have moved ahead of Merkel's conservative Christian democrats in the opinion poll by the uh, MNED Institute for the first time since 2006 according to the Bild und Schönstag, the German press newspaper so lot ongoing at the moment and all of it you could argue is uh, only sort of fueling uh, the flames of uncertainty the French situation just getting um, they're all under a bit of pressure at the moment trying to find a more clear line uh, with the public whereas in Italy Renzi's resignation might cause some headache in terms of formulating of a new party leader for the centre-left government and then in Germany Merkel uh, under growing pressures as well going into the federal elections which obviously are towards the back end of this year. One thing this then does lead into um, is another story that I did send out to you guys this morning. I was talking about gold and although gold's down this morning I think like with a lot of those European headlines we've just discussed I think none of them are quite at the critical point of being uh, near enough to really uh, cause a distinct flare-up in the market in terms of intraday prices. They're all things that I think you just need to be aware of ongoing in the weeks ahead. Gold this morning is a touch lower, but we are up at 12.37 this morning, so it's still pretty high in, uh, in terms of the gold price over the recent months. Uh, and this Bloomberg article was looking at the fact that gold is not behaving in practice the way that it should in theory. And one of the things it's looking at is that since the Fed raised rates, gold has gone up 7%. And in terms of theory, it should be really the other way around. If you were looking at it, um, when the Fed are hiking rates and going into a hiking cycle, um, you would think that gold should have an inverse correlation with that but what we are tending to see here and you can see these kind of arrows pointing towards a decline in gold up to then the event is kind of the trigger if you like for the rally same case in 2016 this is when the fed hiked in 2015 rally thereafter the premise that the fed obviously went from a trajectory of four rate hike to just executing one and then we rallied thereafter. Obviously this very steep decline here that you can see really from November was obviously when Trump won the election, everyone bought into this kind of fiscal element, this that trade that US economy would take a, 
a concerted boost on the back of what he was planning. However, since he's come in, I guess there's been a little bit of apprehension about his focus being directed elsewhere on things like immigration rather than on the fiscal policy side. And as such, people have started to question, I guess, to a certain degree, his ability to execute on his plans and implement them. And so gold, again, has seen a, a quite a strong bounce back up to the upside. You can see here almost $100. That's kind of the gist of what this, this story is talking about. Really, it's the, uh, the Trump execution kind of risk, if you like. The other thing you can see here are ETFs. So investors in the largest exchange traded funds backed by gold have bought more than 40 metric tons this month. Uh, there is also as well a, a seasonal fiscal element in terms of the demand side. You obviously had the Lunar New Year in January. So Chinese typically purchase gold as gifts. So that's probably another part of the equation. And then the other part is what we were just discussing the European election risk that certainly hasn't gone away and probably the closer we get towards it the more I would say uncertainty will build into that event and so you've got things like the Netherlands upcoming on March 15th uh, you've got National Front Marine Le Pen which obviously is a is a bit of a focal point as well at the moment and also the election election certainty um, surrounding Merkel uh, and Germany, which are all, you would say, uh, supportive factors going forward for gold prices. So maybe negating the kind of more classic interest rate environment we're going into with rates going up as telegraphed by um, we've had in the last week with expectations of March on the increase. <laughs> certainly by the summer, markets are, are, are priced for a rate hike and we're still on on path for three this year however despite that fact gold still going up for these aforementioned reasons so just quite a an interesting thing about how the regular correlations may be not just holding true um, given the the different things that are ongoing at the moment elsewhere a few other headlines just to get you up to speed um, Lautenschlager so ECB member German, so leaning on the more hawkish side, so not really too much of a surprise to hear Sabine talking about ECB needs to wait to see if inflation stabilizes in its target zone of just under 2% before interest rates can be raised, but she hopes bond buying program can be scaled down before year end. Again, this will be a certainly an interesting thing to watch going forward with inflation on the increase across uh, European nations will be can the ECB, is it viable for them to continue their QE program at a pace of 60 billion all the way up to their at the moment deadline of December of this year? Or will they at some point start to need start to need to back off that and decrease from 60 to say 40 to 20 before then turning the taps off? Could be a, a, a more strategic uh, way of winding down the markets uh, kind of reliance on such a stimulative program. The other thing that was quite interesting as well was Angela Merkel at the weekend. Obviously, you remember Donald Trump, probably about, I guess it was, this was probably four weeks ago now, Donald Trump said that Euro or Germany is grossly, or the Euro is grossly undervalued, and that's because Germany is a currency manipulator. He said the same thing about Japan and China, or something similar along those lines. Now, quite interesting to see here that Merkel, under pressure, um, on the political stage has kind of made a slight um, concession here saying that on Saturday the euro was too low for Germany but made clear that Berlin had no power to address the problem because monetary policy set the independent or is set by the independent ECB so what's quite interesting here is that she's kind of pushing the problem to the doormat of the European Central Bank trying to distance herself then if she is to have any kind of relationship in meetings with the US administration that really it's not their fault it's the ECB who is has a more control over the currency itself uh, Germany just reacts as a byproduct of that policy being set so I think this is maybe just a little bit of politics going on here and self-preservation to a certain degree from a, a politician in Merkel who's under some 
growing pressure here, as you saw just in that previous, uh, those previous opinion polls, where the SPD has moved ahead of Merkel's parties for the first time in multiple years. So that's kind of how the how the land lies, so to speak, in regards to the news over the weekend. Um, certainly this week, though, there are quite a few things going on. So let's just have a quick look, because today, as I mentioned, is a US holiday, President's Day, so you could expect it to be relatively quiet. Uh, but two other big, I guess, more politically driven events ongoing are there's a Eurogroup meeting happening today. Uh, likelihood Greece is going to be at uh, the top of the agenda. We've had them come to the fore last week in regards to them looking to safeguard their financial future going in towards a large period of redemptions upcoming in the summer. So keep an eye out for that. Also as well, you have the UK House of Lords hearing on Article 50. This is a two-day event. Let me just quickly flick over here. So this is kind of the final stage, if you like. We've had the, the High Court and the Supreme Court rulings. You've had the House of Commons vote through the government's bill in order to trigger Article 50. Now this is the House of Lords, which the, or Theresa May, in terms of the government, does not have a majority in the House of Lords. Uh, and they're going to be speaking about various amendments that have been put forward. So this there's more than 190 peers have registered to speak during the second reading. It's going to start at 3.30 this afternoon, and then it's going to conclude on Tuesday. Now, if you've read any of the news about this over the weekend, then essentially what it is is they're debating some potential amendments, but overall the general gist of this is that the peers will not block Brexit, and nor um, are they likely to waive this bill through without asking the Commons to think about a number of issues? So they're going to debate a few things, more ratifying what we've already heard, and that parliamentary members should have a say on the shape of discussions and the final Brexit bill. That's kind of all plan, so to speak. That's generally where this is heading. Uh, it's very unlikely and there's no sign that unelected lords would want to go into battle with MPs and the government over Brexit or meddle with the referendum's mandate. So this I see as minimal risk. However, that being said then, you know then how the market is positioned. So if there is any type of complication here and the House of Lords start to delay tactics start to come in and it looks like then that might put into jeopardy the triggering of article 50 by the end of march then that's what could potentially have some ramification for the sterling currency in that situation uh, going back to the the calendar then tuesday you start to get the various uh, manufacturing and service pmis from various european nations japan overnight you also get then the conclusion of that House of Lords hearing. Uh, Draghi, no topic as yet, but we'll look for that in more clarity. He's speaking, uh, this is all part of probably the Eurogroup meetings, I guess. You've also got the manufacturing service PMIs from the US on Tuesday. Wednesday, you get arguably the, the main kind of headline reading on a monthly basis out of Germany. That's the IFO report. You also get the second estimate of UK GDP. US data, FOMC minutes come out in the evening. Uh, don't forget as well in terms of the oil infantries, given the President's Day holiday, the APIs will be on Wednesday night with the Department of Energy's oil infantry data coming out on Thursday instead of the regular Wednesday. And then things start to tail off in the latter half of the week though, jobless claims on Thursday, mortgage approvals, um, the revised Michigan reading. So Thursday, Friday, pretty quiet. Really your busiest, busiest calendar days are really Tuesday and Wednesday this week. But just wrapping up then, relative uh, moderate risk on this morning, a uh, couple of European political situations just to keep a, a half an ear on, but nothing that's really affecting the market this morning. More so, I guess it's just a, a positive record high finish again over in the US on Friday. That fed through into a relatively quiet Asian session, which was positive causing the, the move higher this morning. A couple of individual standout performance on the stock side, despite the weakness in Unilever with that M&A deal dropping through. 
the dollar's pretty flat overall, marginally softer, helping elevate the, the major currency pairs. Your cable just sitting above pivot, euro just below its respective level there. So that's pretty much it. I'm uh, going to leave it at that, let you get on with it. And so have a good session, and I'll see you in the chat room. Thanks, guys. <laughs>